area of interest are general anesthesia, acute and chronic pain management, ultrasound guided procedures, healthcare quality, and patient safety. Ma'am have various uh, awards and achievements. And the moderator for this session is Dr. Ankita. She is a SR in our hospital, Dr. RML Hospital. And uh, the presenter is our PG, uh, Dr. Anupma Rathor. She's a third year PG in Dr. RML Hospital. Now, ma'am, it's over to you, Jotsan. It's over to you. A very good afternoon, everyone. Ma'am, you are not audible, ma'am. You're audible, ma'am. Okay. Very good afternoon, everyone. And uh, not yet audible, ma'am. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Very good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, AP EC team, for giving me this opportunity. So let us start with our short case. So, uh, will uh, Anupama, will you be presenting the case first? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting the case of 14 months old male child. Uh, patient name uh, Krishna, resident of Nangar, New Delhi, informant his mother, uh, his complaints. The patient was brought to IOPD 10 days back with his parents with complaints of whitish area in the center of both eyes since birth. History of presenting illness, white opacity was noticed in both eyes since birth by child's mother, which was gradually progressive and painless, not associated with the redness, pain and discharge. No history, or no history of any eye trauma, division of eyes, drooping of eyelids, no history of deafness. And there is no history of chronic use of any eye drops. Birth history, birth out of the child, first child of the parents, full term normal vaginal delivery in hospital with birth weight of 2.6 kg. Baby cried immediately after birth. No history of meconium stain lichen. No history of delayed cry, apneic spells or NICU admission. The child has attained all the milestones at appropriate age. Child has received immunization according to the age. Antenatal history of mother. Non-consanguineous marriage. No history of intake of any drugs, radiation exposure. No history of any infections and no history of smoking. There is no significant past medical and surgical history. There is no significant family history. General physical examination. Child is alert, playful and sitting comfortably on mother's lap. Weight of the child is 10 kg. Temperature is 37.6 degrees centigrade. Pulse rate is 90 per minute, regular in rhythm, good volume. Blood pressure is 90 by 56 millimeters of mercury taken in the left upper arm. Respiratory rate is 16 per minute. Saturation 99% on room air. No pallor, no pallor, icterus, sinusis, clubbing, either edema or lip adenopathy. Then ocular examination, head posture is normal. Pupil examined with diffused torch light. Both pupils are normal in size with white opacity seen in pupillary area. Perception of light is positive bilaterally. Then ocular symmetry is maintained. Ocular movement is full range in all directions. Rest of the ocular examinations are within the normal limits. Then systemic examination, respiratory system. Chest normal on inspection, palpation, symmetrical chest rise, bilateral air entry equal and clear, no added sounds. Cardiovascular system, apex beat in fifth intercostal space adjacent to mid clavicular line. On auscultation, S1 and S2 heard, no murmurs heard. Then see, uh, central nervous system examination within the normal limits. GI system and musculoskeletal examination are also within the normal limits. Then airway examination, the airway of the child could not be assessed as child was non-cooperative. No obvious external facial deformity or asymmetry. Mandible and maxilla adequate in shape and size. Then the diagnosis of the patient is a 14-month-old male child has history of whitening of lens of both eyes since birth without any obvious congenital anomaly diagnosed to be a case of congenital cataract. Okay. okay. Good. So, uh, you have covered many points in the history. So, uh, what will you, uh, how will you investigate the child? Would you like to go for some investigation? Uh, yes, ma'am. 
Cataract is a minimally invasive surgery. As per latest ASC guidelines, no tests are required if the patient is clinically fit. But the, my patient is a pediatric case, case so I'm planning for general anesthesia. So I would like to ask for the complete blood count in which I, will, I would order hemoglobin to rule out any anemia, anemia total leukocyte count to rule out any infections, and the platelet counts because it is a part of the complete blood count. So I would also like to ask platelet. And uh, I would also like to uh, order for the serum electrolytes, sodium and potassium to rule out any metabolic disorders, and also to uh, and also to order the serum calcium and phosphorus, phosphorus, uh, phosphorus to rule out any metabolic disorders. Like these patients are more prone for the hypercalcemia. And uh, okay, so and what are we? Okay. So what are the, uh, you know, congenital anomalies or disorders you are expecting, which can be present in the child of a cataract, congenital cataract? Then the patient can be, as, uh, the uh, congenital anomaly can be associated with the Down syndrome. Then, uh, then the Perry Robinson syndrome, the Bella syndrome, then the uh, Cryducat syndrome, Edward syndrome, and the Patau syndrome also. And the metabolic disorders, my G6, PD1 deficiency can also be there, galactosemia can also be Okay, okay. And torch infections in the mother during pregnancy? Then there is no history of uh, torch infection in the mother. Good. All right. So in, in case of any of these syndromes, if they are present, uh, the usually the problem which we face is difficult intubation. The a difficult airway is the presentation for us, which is concerning us mostly. So you have actually ruled out that. Okay. And you told in your history that the child was not on any eye drops. What kind of eye drops can the child be on? And if they are on those eye drops, then what are the problems which we can have? Ma'am, uh, if the patient can be on the steroids, eye drops, chronic use of the steroids, the patient can develop cataract because of that. And the uh, uh, patient can be on the acetazolamide, which causes the metabolic acidosis. And, uh, and uh, also, if there is any analgesic eye drop, patient can land up with the bronchial asthma also. And sometimes they can be on atropine, it can lead to dry mouth. If they can and, the blocker eye drops, okay, bradycardia, okay, and bronchospasm. Right, so what will be your goals of anesthesia in this child? This is a pediatric patient. Uh, my goals of anesthesia are to maintain the intraocular pressure, a good kinesia and analgesia, and uh, to prevent from the post-operative nausea and vomiting, smooth induction and smooth emergence of the patient. You maintain, okay, to prevent the rise in the intraocular pressure, right? To have a completely relaxed patient intraoperatively, Prevention of nausea vomiting particularly and prevention of cup and uh, stress response. Right. Okay, so how will you pre medicate the child? Ma'am, uh, I will give the angiolytics oral midazolam 0.5 milligram per kg. In this child, this is 5 milligram orally, uh, 15 to 30 minutes pre operatively. Okay, good. So, uh, what are the other options? Uh, are, do you have any alternatives for pre-medication? This is one, correct? Any other? I can give the oral chloral hydrate 50 milligram per kg. 500 milligram, 50, 30 to 45 minutes prior. Okay. Anything else? Any other? Uh, which we can I can give uh, intranasal dexmeditomidine. That is 2 microgram per kg. 20 microgram, 30 to 60 minutes preoperatively. All right. Will you like to give opioid as pre-medication in this child? Ma'am, I would, uh, I can give, but I, I would like to avoid the fentanyl, one microgram per kg, because it causes the post-operative nausea and vomiting, which I want to prevent. All right. And I can give, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Ma'am, oral ketamine can also be given, but I would like to avoid because it increases the intraocular pressure and also it causes the emergence of the uh, agitation, emergence agitation. Okay, accepted. So, how will you induce the child? You have premedicated the child with oral midazolam, uh, right? So, how will you induce the child now? 
Ma'am, uh, this is a pediatric patient, so I would like to go for the general anesthesia. Before taking the patient inside the OT, I would ensure the OT temperature, the OT temperature, switch off all the ACs and switch on the warmers. Uh, then uh, I will check the anesthesia machine, I will check the suction, will be ready with the uh, induction drugs and the emergency drugs, and I will ensure the warm IV fluids. Then I will take the patient inside the OT. Uh, then uh, I have two uh, options, either go for the inhalational induction and the IV induction, but the cannula is not present, uh, the cannula is not present, so I would like to go for the inhalational induction. So I will uh, find the circuit with 8% concentration of the sebum fl fluorine simultaneously. I, I will attach all the ACA standard monitors like ECG, uh, NIBP, temperature probe and uh, pulse oximetry. Then once the patient loses the consciousness, I will secure the IV cannula. Then I will start with the injection fentanyl, one microgram per kg, that is 10, 10 microgram, two to three minutes prior to the intubation. Then I will go for uh, injection lignocaine, preservative free, 1.5 milligram, that is uh, 15 milligram, uh, uh, 90 seconds prior to the intubation. Then uh, I will uh, give uh, injection uh, propofol, one milligram per kg, 10 milligram. 10 milligram in this child before the intubation. And then I will check the bag and mask ventilation. Once it is confirmed, then I will give a bacuronium 0.1 milligram per kg, that is one milligram. Once, uh, uh, once the patient is relaxed, then I will uh, secure the airway with the flexometallic cup, flexometallic uh, endotracheal tube of appropriate size, either four or three or 3.5 millimeters of internal diameter and fixed opposite to the uh, surgery of the eye. Then uh, I will maintain the, then I will uh, connect to the uh, side. All right, we'll just uh, stop here. So we have uh, induced the child with inhalational anesthetic. Okay, we have used sevoflurane to induce. And as per need, you have topped it up with propofol also before intubation. Okay. And uh, so how, uh, what are the measures you take to avoid the increase in IOP, which is one of your goals? When, uh, when I am intubating the patient, there are uh, there is a laryngoscopy response which increases the intraocular pressure. So I will I would like to hear uh, plant the response with the injection lignocaine preservative three one point five mg per kg, which is fifteen milligram before next seconds of the intubation. Okay. So, uh, yeah. can you, right, right. Uh, can you induce the child with ketamine? Can you induce this child with ketamine? Ma'am, uh, I will avoid, ma'am. I can induce, but I will avoid because it increases the intraocular pressure. And also, there is a chance of the emergency ag agitation in the patient. So, we will not prefer ketamine. Okay. Can you use succinylcholine for relaxing the child for intubation? Ma'am, uh, I will avoid uh, succinylcholine because it is a elective surgery and also it increases the intraocular pressure of the patient, uh, which uh, in, uh, I will avoid, ma'am. Okay, how much, can you tell me how much rise in IOP happens with succinylcholine? Ma'am, it increases the, it increases the intraocular pressure by 8 to 9 millimeters of mercury within the 30 seconds of the given of the succinylcholine. Mm -hmm. Then suppress it after five to ten years. Right, right. Can you use video laryngoscopy to smoothen the intubation further? Will it help? Yes, ma'am. I can use the, the video laryngoscopy. If it is available, yes. All right. So, uh, okay. Next, you have intubated the child using what is the tube size you will use and which kind of device will you use? Ma'am, I will use the uh, flexometallic cuffed endotracheal tube with the size of 4 or 3.5 millimeters of diameter according to the patient's age. Okay, so how do we calculate this tube size? Uh, for less than 6 years, age in years by 3 plus 3.5 millimeters of diameter. For more than 6 years, age by 4 plus 4.5 millimeters of diameter, internal diameter. Right, this is for cuffed tube. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, one is flexometallic tube. Can you use any other kind of tube? Are there other tubes which are available, which can be used? Ma'am, uh, I can use ring adair alvin tube of South Pole away from the eye surgeries. I will prefer. I can use, ma'am. 
can use a south facing RAE tube, but sometimes in small children, uh, it is possible that the length might not be appropriate. It might be too long for the child. In that case, you can go for flexometallic tubes. All right. Okay, so now we have incorporated and now how will you ventilate and uh, how are you going to maintain the anesthesia? Ma'am, I will maintain with the 50% concentration of the oxygen with air and with isofluorine of 1% concentration. 1% concentration, okay. Right, so you are you said uh, oxygen and air, right? So why are you not using nitrous? Are you avoiding nitrous? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I am avoiding the nitrous oxide because uh, it, uh, it increases the uh, uh, it increases the post-operative nausea and vomiting. The chances of post-operative nausea. Okay, and how much mag do you aim to keep in this child? One. Okay, you'll keep a mag of one, right? You can also go for maintenance using propofol because that will help you better in preventing the post of nausea vomiting. You can go for 0.5 mag with inhalational and add propofol to maintenance. That can be done because it helps in preventing the PONV better. Right. And uh, you can use dexmedetomidine as well. That will help in preventing emergence delirium also. Mm -hmm. That is protective, dexmedetomidine. Okay. So uh, next, what will you do? How will you give fluids to this patient? Ma'am, I will give the physio uh, physiological isotonic ringer lactate solution uh, with the holiday cigar formula 421 rule. The weight of the patient is 10 kilogram. So maintenance of the fluid is, uh, 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 is uh, 40 ml. Maintenance of the fluid is a 40 ml and uh, I will replace with all the replacement losses. 40 ml plus uh, a half of the fluid deficit plus blood loss, urine output and third space loss. Okay, by holiday cigar, if we, we if we use four to one, the ten kg child is there, so it becomes forty ml maintenance per hour, right? Will you add some fasting also to it? The pre-op uh, also will you add to it? In pre-op order, in pre-op orders, the fasting of of six hours for the formula milk, four hours for the breast milk, and two hours for the clear liquids. And this patient is on the breast milk, so I would uh, calculate with the four hours, ma'am, in the anterior. So you have calculated, no, in the holiday cigar for the fluid therapy, one is the maintenance. Will you add some fasting deficit also to the hourly requirement? Yes, ma'am. 4 ml uh, fasting for the patient of 10 kg. So you uh, multiply it by 4, 4 hours, and then you give half in the first hour, and then you give again half and half in the remaining 2 hours. Okay. okay. So they, this is one way of doing it, holiday cigar. There will be very other uh, replacement losses which will be required. But in pediatrics, you can also go for the rule of 10. Have you heard of rule of 10 for fluid therapy? Nowadays, uh, there is uh, some other uh, way of uh, fluid therapy that is 10 rule. Uh, in this patient, it will be 50 ml per hour. So that is 10 ml per kg per hour you can do. And then you replace the losses. So that becomes 50 ml. Uh, 100. 100 ml. Okay, how will you do analgesia to this child? I will give uh, injection paracetamol with 15 mg per kg, that is 150 milligram. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I can also give a, a, a reactor suppository of the diclofenac with 1 milligram per kg, that is 10 milligram. Okay, so you will go for paracetamol and you can go for diclofenac suppository. Okay, anything else? Is there any kind of, uh, are there some blocks which we can give and do will we give in this child? Yes, I mean, pediatric cases, we will prefer the subtenance block for the local anesthesia, for the pain management. We can go. You can go for subtenance block. Okay. Can you go for other blocks? Are, what are the other blocks which are given for ocular surgeries? Ma'am, we have the retrobulbar block, peribulbar block also. Mm -hmm. so, and the facial block also. Okay, so will you like to give them for this child? Ma'am, in this child, I will avoid because the complications of those blocks are the more. And uh, subtenant block is the extra conal block, ma'am. Okay. So and chances those... are less compared to, to those. Right, so subtenant is the preferred block. We can go for that, right. All right. So uh, then the surgery is done. And how will you reverse the child? Ma'am, I would like to reverse. First of all, I will switch off the inhalational gases. 
and uh, then i will start with the and oxygen 100% i will start with injection of neostigmin glycopyrrolate neostigmin with the, in the concentration of 50 microgram per kg that is 500 microgram and uh, glycopyrrolate with 10 microgram per kg that is 100 microgram then uh, once the i will i would like to extubate the patient in a deep vein uh, because i want to avoid the coughing straining uh, of the patient uh, which increase the intraocular pressure so once the efforts is continuous efforts are coming uh, uh, tidal volume 3 to 5 ml per kg and uh, ad- generating the adequate frequency then i would like to reverse the patient okay so uh, you would like to extubate the child deep all right so you can extubate the child deep or you can extubate the child awake but if you extubate the child deep you avoid a lot of stress responses okay fair enough you can do that right and uh, uh, can you tell me uh, what is the emergence delirium in this child how will you find it and uh, how can you how will you score it because we discussed that you will be maintaining on isoflurane so why not on sevoflurane because we induce with sevo but uh, could we have maintained this child on sevoflurane we can induce uh, ma'am we are inducing with the sevoflurane because either it is a sweet smelling but i will maintain on the isoflurane because the chances of the emergence ag- agitation is more with the sevoflurane right so uh, what is emergent like how do you score emergence delirium in post operative kids there is a peed scoring of the emergence delirium Mm-hmm. Uh, there is there is a score of five four three two one uh, five there are five components ma'am the mm-hmm. uh, uh, yes there are five components right for peed score like eye contact eye contact with the mother extra eye contact with the mother so I will score with five four three two one according to the response of the patient. Mm-hmm. then we'll go for the uh, okay so i will tell you there are the, in the peed score there are basically five components eye contact purposeful movements awareness about the surroundings right and yes. restlessness and inconsolability inconsolable right so uh, for the first three things the eye contact purposeful movements and awareness around the surroundings the scoring is from 4 to 0 4 to 0 1 right 4 means not at all and 0 means extreme right and but for the last two restless and inconsolability the scoring is from 0 to 4 0 0 yeah. means not at all and 4 means extreme so more the score more is the emergence delirium just right this is one commonly used scale for emergence delirium correct and there are two others that is known as cravero c r a v e r o cravero scale and the watcha scale w a t c h a watcha scale those are simpler scales like peed is a slightly complicated scale those are simpler scales they have only 1 2 3 4 5 scoring right the like obtended asleep awake crying thrashing so you score it 1 2 3 4 5 and for watcha it is asleep calm crying but consolable crying but inconsolable and agitated 0 1 2 3 4 so what we can do in a practical situation we can use a cravero as a watcha scale which is a simpler score and if it is more than 4 we can go for a detailed peed scale score okay and uh, what drugs can cause emergence delirium and how do we prevent it what are the preventive drugs uh, ma'am uh, inhalational ga- inhalational gases the sevo can cause the emergence delirium mm-hmm. and uh, in induction drugs uh, ketamine can cause the emergence delirium so we will avoid these two drugs okay so we can give we can avoid the drugs we can give ketam we can give midaz we can get dexmedetomidine they are protective also okay right how will you avoid post operative nausea and vomiting in this child ma'am uh, i will give the they we have a pro, uh, dual therapy uh, for the antimetic antimetic prophylaxis injection uh, injection on net centron 0.1 mg per kg that is 1 mg half an hour before the extubation and we can give a injection dexamethasone uh, 0.1 mg per kg that is 1 mg and when do we give dexamethasone when do we give dexamethasone to the child in no, the start after the injection we can give So we give dexamethasone after induction, and when do we give ordinance at all? Before the ex- half an hour of the extubation. 
we'll give it towards the end before extubation. Okay. Even propofol, when added to our uh, uh, anesthetic management, it has a protective effect for PUNV, right? Will you like to give droperidol to the child? Ma'am, we can give, but I will avoid because it has a more uh, systemic side effects, like extra pyramidal side effects are more Okay. All right. Good. Now, in the case of cataract, usually we do not uh, expect uh, OCR to happen, oculocardic reflex, but we can still talk about it because it's an eye surgery. So, can you tell me about oculocardic reflex? Ma'am, oculocardic reflex is a trigeminovagal reflex which is introduced by the Dagner and Ashtonary. There are two pathways, afferent and the afferent pathways. When the stimulus is given on the extraocular muscle, the, from the afferent pathway, there are short and long ciliary nerves which goes through the ciliary ganglion and then goes through the uh, trigeminal gastrin gas ganglion which goes to the floor of the fourth ventricle. From there, uh, through the efferent uh, pathway, the uh, stimulus is taken to the heart uh, and is stimulated by the vagus nerve, which causes the bradycardia, active ventricular blocks, and uh, also causes the post-operative nausea and vomiting, and sometimes the uh, systole. Okay, so the afferent is trigeminal and the afferent is vagal. Okay, and uh, if it happens in the, during the surgery, what can you do to treat it? Ma'am, uh, first of all, I would uh, ask the surgeon to stop the stimulus, uh, to stop the manipulation of the stimulus. I will deepen the plane of anesthesia and I will uh, give the adequate oxygen with 100%. And uh, then uh, uh, I can treat with the injection atropine, uh, 20 microgram per kg, that is 200 microgram. And also can give the glycopyrrolate uh, with 10 microgram per kg, that is 100 microgram. Okay, so it can be given prophylactic. Some uh, people like to give it prophylactic in strabismus surgeries. Commonly it happens in strabismus surgeries. Or you can give it as a part of treatment. It is okay. So uh, it is mostly the... Uh, you know, pull on the uh, medial rectus muscle, which leads to oculocardic reflex, right? And uh, in strabismus surgeries, if a child is for strabismus surgery, particularly there can be associated muscular dystrophies, which we should be careful of, and they'd have more incidence of POV, and it requires more pain relief also. Okay. Okay. So, uh, can you tell me the differences between an adult and a pediatric airway? In pediatric airway, we start with the supraglottic, uh, the external layers. The, the external layers are narrow in the pediatric and wide in the adult. Uh, tongue is larger in size in the pediatric and uh, smaller in the uh, adult. And uh, epiglottis is a floppy shaped in the omega floppy shaped in the uh, pediatric. And, uh, and the larynx is uh, more anterior in the pediatric than the adult. And it is more above the uh, C3, C4 in the pediatric and uh, C5, C6 in the adult. And there is a narrowest part uh, of the subglottic in the pediatric and wider in the, and the narrowest part uh, in the adult is the vocal cord. Mm -hmm. And cartilages are more uh, soft in the pediatric and harder in the adult. Okay. Uh, if you do not have, uh, you said you will uh, induce with sevoflurin. If you do not have sevoflurin, is there any other anesthetic agent you can use for induction? Inhalational agent? We can use the halothin for the induction because both C1 and halo both are the sweet smelling. Mm -hmm. So we cannot use isofluorine for induction? For induction, we are not using isofluorine. Right. When we can maintain on ISO, uh, it is better we induce with ISO only and then we maintain on ISO. Should we do that? Because ISO can cause uh, airway irritation and it can lead to spasms, laryngospasms. So we don't want to use that. We induce with sevoflurane and then we can maintain on ISO. Right? Similarly, halothin can, can be used for inhalational induction. Okay. Um, can you, uh, will you like to go for superglottic device? Because superglottic device will reduce the stress response. Yes, ma'am. I can use a supraglottic airway device, but in this patient, I would like to avoid because when the patient is handed over to the surgeon, it is very difficult to maintain the airway, manipulate the airway if the supraglottic airway device got displaced. And uh, 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 and the ET tube is uh, there are more chances of the 
aspiration with the supraglottic airway device as compared to the ET tube, in which the chances of aspiration are very less. Not the yeah, aspiration, but yes, yeah, because the sharing of the space is there with the surgeon, that is why we would prefer endotracheal tube. But you know, most of the surgeries can be easily done in SGT without any risk of aspiration in the second generation devices. And also, suppress there is no chance of uh, laryngoscopic response in the supraglottic airway device. We will prefer an ET here just because it is a sharing of the space. So it becomes easier for the surgeon. Right. Okay. So, uh, good. You have uh, covered most of the things. So, and basically the child bilateral cataract and the only PL was positive perception of light. So the child cannot see much. It, uh, so the child requires very careful handling and good anxiolysis also preoperatively. Right. So we are good. Ankita, will you like to summarize? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So it's a case of congenital cataract. In a case of congenital cataract, the patient presents with whitish opacity in the center of the eye, which is noted by the parents. It may be associated with diminution of vision, strabismus, nystagmus, photosensitivity, behavioral changes. In case of congenital cataract, uh, in case of congenital cataract, the ocular findings are mostly a part of a syndrome. Most of the times, the cause is idiopathic. Other causes include syndromes like Down syndrome, rubella syndrome, Pierre Robinson syndrome, Patau syndrome, and trisomy syndrome. The metabolic diseases include diabetes, hypoglycemia, galactosemia, Fabris disease, and Wilson's disease. Infections like rubella, syphilis, cytomegalovirus, and varicella can also be the causative cause of congenital cataract. Hereditary uh, causes in terms of autosomal dominant form can also be associated with congenital cataract. Trauma and chronic drug-induced state can also cause congenital cataract. During the pre-anesthetic checkup, detailed antenatal, family history of congenital cataract, birth history, and clinical examination of all systems are done with detailed ocular examination by ophthalmologists. Investigations, including specific blood and radiological investigations on suspicion of systemic involvement, can be ordered. The specific anesthetic concerns in ocular surgery include extremes of age group, associated comorbidities in elderly patients and congenital syndromes in children, systemic effects of ophthalmic drugs, anesthetic effects on intraocular pressure, trigger of ocular cardiac reflex, post-operative nausea vomiting complication, and local anesthetic block complications. The strategies which are taken during the anesthesia to prevent the increase in intraocular pressure include avoid direct pressure on the globe, avoiding any increase in central venous pressure by preventing coughing during induction and intubation, ensuring a deeper level of anesthesia and relaxation prior to laryngoscopy, avoiding head down positions, and extubating in deep asleep state. Avoiding any pharmacological agents that increase the intraocular pressure like succinylcholine and ketamine. The different types of ocular anesthesia are general anesthesia and local anesthesia. The senile cataracts are generally operated under regional anesthesia, but congenital cataracts are operated under general anesthesia. The goals of general anesthesia and cataract surgery include smooth endotracheal intubation, stable intraocular pressure throughout the surgery, avoidance of severe ocular cardiac reflexes, a motionless field for the surgeon, smooth emergence, and prevention of post-operative nausea vomiting. The patient is pre-medicated during the, uh, before the surgery to avoid any anxiety, crying, and straining of the child by pre-medicating uh, pre with mirazolam 15 to 30 minutes orally pre-operatively. Opioids are avoided in the pre-medication due to high risk of post-operative nausea vomiting. Ketamine is avoided as it increases the intraocular pressure and also has a higher incidence of emergence delirium. Sedative pre-medication is avoided in syndromic children associated with difficult airway. During induction, the patient should be avoiding coughing, straining, and any accidental rise in intrathoracic pressure. Hence, inhalational induction can be done by using 100% oxygen and sevoflurane 8 percent primed circuit if there is no preoperative secured cannula. But if the patient has a preoperatively secured cannula, intravenous induction can be done using propofol or thiopentone as an IV induction agent. Ketamine is avoided for IV induction agent as it increases the intraocular pressure. Drugs are used to attenuate the pressure response to laryngoscopy and intubation to prevent any increase in intraocular pressure. non depolarizing muscle relaxants, they do not have any significant direct effects on intraocular pressure, hence they can be used safely for intubation. 
Succinylcholine elevates the intraocular pressure, hence it is contraindicated in elective surgeries, but it can be used in open eye, full stomach situation surgeries. The airway concerns in a child with congenital cataract include difficult airway if there are any associated syndromes associated in babies. Mask handling has to be gentle to avoid any external pressure on the eye. Laryngoscopy and intubation has to be quick and gentle within 15 seconds. Airway in congenital cataract is close to the surgical field and it is inaccessible once it is covered in drapes. Hence, airway has to be secured by endotracheal tube of appropriate size, either by PVC endotracheal tube, flexometallic or south pole uh, ring adder elvin tube, and it is kept away from the surgical field. Coming to the maintenance, the child is maintained in a fully relaxed and deep state with controlled ventilation using oxygen, air, and isofluorine, maintaining a MAC of 1. For a smooth and well perfused eye, relative hypotension, normoxia, normocapnia, 15 degree head up tilt, and prevention of hypothermia in pediatric patients as they are more prone to heat loss, and adequate analgesia is given using injection paracetamol 15 mg per kg IV. Diclofenac suppositories are placed, short acting opioids can also be given, and local and stick block, especially the subtenance block, can be given to provide prolonged post operative analgesia. Prophylactic anti emetic dual therapy is given using onancetron and dexamethasone intraoperatively. Extubation and emergence should be kept smooth under moderate anesthetic depth. Deep extubation is preferred in these children to avoid any coughing and spraining on endotracheal tube as it increases the intraocular pressure. But awake extubation is supposed to be done in patients with associated difficult airway in which the blunting of cough reflex can be done by using IV lignocaine 1.5 mg per kg. The major post-operative concerns in congenital cataract include post-operative nausea vomiting for which multimodal approach is taken. Prophylactic anti-emetic dual therapy is given intraoperatively and by avoiding any drugs which increase the post-operative nausea vomiting complication like nitrous oxide and opioids. One more complication of a uh, the pediatric patients are emergence delirium, most commonly seen in the ENT surgeries and ophthalmic surgeries. It is recorded and it is diagnosed by using the PEED scale. It may lead to delay in the recovery of the patients. Hence, parental presence is uh, encouraged in the rec uh, recovery area. It is usually self-limiting and it subsides mostly after 30 to 40 minutes in the recovery period in the presence of the parents. Any drugs which in with increased incidence of emergence delirium are to be avoided intraoperatively. Post-operative pain is also a concern and it is managed by giving paracetamol, NSAIDs and by local anesthetic block given after the surgery with give prolonged analgesia after the surgery. Severe post-operative pain cause should be sought. It can be a sign of complications. Thank you. Here, I would just like to add one thing. Actually, yes. ketamine is uh, really not that bad for IOP. It has been in various studies have shown that up to 4 mg, if we exceed the dose of 4 mg per kg, then it leads to rise in IOP. So that is slightly debatable for ketamine. Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ankita. It was a wonderful presentation and all aspects are discussed in this case. Now uh, we will show you the second quiz of the day. Uh, Thank you, Can you show the questions for the second quiz of the day? Uh, the first question is, which of the following is true regarding administering general anesthesia to a COPD patient? Choice A, nitrous oxide plus opioid technique is ideal. B, use large tidal volumes. C, use lower breathing rates to permit more exhalation time. D, correct the hypercapnia intraoperatively to help extubate early. Question two. Which of the following is one of the benefits regarding cessation of smoking 12 to 24 hours prior to surgery? Shift of oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right, improvement in mucociliary transport, decrease in sputum production, improved small airway functions, and add option or uh, decode. Uh, now we are not going to have any lunch break as we are already exceeding the time. So we will go to the next session. The chairperson for the next session is Dr. Baljeet Singh, sir. He is professor and head in SGT Medical College, Gurgaon. 
सर है वेरियस पब्लिकेशन एंड सर इज एग्जामिनर फॉर एम डी डी ए पी डी सी सी डी एन बी एग्जाम एंड डी एम एग्जाम एंड सर इज एसेसर फॉर नेशनल बोर्ड ऑफ एग्जामिनेशन मेडिकल काउंसिल ऑफ इंडिया एंड सर इज अ सब्जेक्ट एक्सपर्ट फॉर यू पी एस सी एंड वेरियस स्टेट पब्लिकेशन सर्विसेस सर इज अ मेंबर बोर्ड ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स इंडियन कॉन्फेडरेशन ऑफ हेल्थ केयर एग्रीडेशन and sir is treasurer indian society for study of pain since uh, for 2010 to 2012 sir is a member governing council isa national from 2009 to 2011 sir was a vice president indian society of anesthesiologists national from 2017 to 2018 uh, and uh, sir is a director scientific uh, sir is a director in scientific committee in, in the re- Indian Resuscitation Council Federation sir is also a CEO and president designate Indian College of Anesthesiologists uh over to you sir Baljeet sir sir have you joined sir uh sir will join us shortly and sir will introduce the speaker for this session we are waiting for sir sir will join soon Sir is with us, and sir will introduce the speaker for this session. Sir, over to you. Welcome, sir. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, before we go ahead, uh, let me uh, congratulate the organizers of this uh, uh, program uh, for a wonderful job that they are doing. And uh, I really appreciate the team RML Hospital who have taken up uh, this onerous task. of a seven day a teaching program online and uh, hats off to them my compliments and my congratulations to them well friends uh, uh, i have tremendous pleasure in uh, introducing uh, my uh, colleague uh, at rml hospital dr akhilesh gupta he is professor of anesthesia at uh, atul bihari vajpayee institute of medical sciences dr rml hospital new delhi uh, he has a lot of achievements rather than what's uh, written there he has much much more than i i i uh, appreciate his uh, modesty that he has just mentioned that his interest is in pain management and interest in ab management but besides that he has uh, you know uh, achieved a lot uh, on the academic front a lot of publications and a uh, lot many uh, you know presentations and delivered lectures all over the country on various topics and of course his core uh, uh, area of interest and activity is the airway management and pain management so i know him for number of years and uh, he is a, he is an achiever so uh, i will now pass on the mic to uh, to him for uh, this very important topic which is of interest to uh, the youngsters particularly Uh, and why i say that uh, interest to youngsters because this is uh, one area they just cannot escape i mean no way that they can say you know i do not need this because this is one machine we live our life with and we must know this machine uh, in and out thoroughly uh, apart from the practical aspect 